uh, turned into in papers that you read them and count them there. Um, so the first part will be a little bit of an overview about reported leads in general, with some examples of specific reported leads. There is more reported leads than the ones I will um, discuss. And then I will um, show you how we use reported leads or how reported leads are used in uh, our research. So what is reported gene first? Start with a definition. A gene goes to protein. It's not actually the gene that you can measure. It's meant that you can measure the protein. So the gene goes to protein, and the protein can be relatively easy, visualized, and or quantified. So in some cases, you would like an easy visualization. In other cases, you would like a quantification of the expression of the protein. Sometimes you may have both. Um, it can be self-reporting. If the protein itself is reported, you don't need a substrate. This will become clear a little bit later in the examples. They can also be enzymes, in which case you need a substrate. So in this case, self-reporting, the protein itself can be visualized or quantified. If, it's an, if it is an enzyme, the protein itself cannot be visualized or quantified, but if you give the protein a substrate, the turnover product of the Substrate may be visualized or quantified. And a reporter gene is usually isolated from one organism and used in a different organism in some kind of transgenic approach or transient expression state. Okay. So first some examples that some of you may know. Um, one most well-known reporter is the green fluorescent protein, or GFP. It's been isolated from a jellyfish, and uh, it doesn't need a substrate because the protein itself uh, fluoresces. Um, does anybody know what fluorescence means? It actually means that the protein takes up uh, light from one wavelength and emits light on another wavelength. So in this case, it actually takes up UV light or blue light and emits green light. <coughs> right. um, so it has been used in different organisms. So it's been isolated. The gene has been isolated from this species, cloned into expression vectors, and uh, expressed in mouse. And you see that the skin of the mouse becomes green fluorescent. And this is a an example of my own research. Um, during my PhD, I expressed um, promoters uh, with GFP and sugarcane, and this is like a sugarcane stem uh, cross section of it. And so we tried to find high levels of gene expression in, in sugarcane. So since then, GFP has been modified to a lot of different versions. And you can see here this multicolor. This is not like uh, to, to paint your, your student room or something, but this is um, the original one, GFP here, <coughs> green fluorescent one. And you can see we have a whole range of fluorescent forms, blue fluorescent, yellow fluorescent, red fluorescent. And they're all basically made from the original green fluorescent protein by mutagenesis. So by mutating a couple of uh, nucleotides or base pairs in the coding sequence, you can change some amino acids, and by changing some amino acids, you change the properties of the um, fluorescent protein. And it becomes fluorescent. It emits suddenly other wavelengths than green, or it can be excited by other wavelengths than uh, UV or blue. So multicolored variants can have the advantage that you can do um, in the same. Yeah, here is only one, one variant used, but if you have different promoters and different colors, you can sort of make a multicolored image depending on, on what you want to investigate. Okay. So other examples, a uh, well-known one is luciferase. It's been isolated from the firefly. And what happens is that luciferin and ATP, it says here add, if you, have to, if you want to assay the uh, luciferase activity um, outside of the firefly, you need to add this. Um, the firefly itself will produce the citrine in ATP, and this will be uh, turned over to the citrine aluminate and pyrophosphate, 
luciferol adenylate and oxygen gives oxaluciferic <coughs> AMP and the emission of light. Okay, so basically photons are emitted. And how we can we detect it? With a cool CCD camera. This is uh, where the gene, the luciferase gene, is used in a Arabidopsis plant. And um, the CCD camera picks up the emission of light. If you have a high color, so red means a high emission of light, blue is a little bit less. Um, so you see here three different plants, and you can see that the third plant has got a high expression of the luciferase gene. So what we did here was, this is a plant growing into a, in an agar plate, and the plant contains a luciferase gene under expression of a promoter. We add luciferin and ATP, we spray it, it's like a spray, we spray it on there, and then you put it under the CCD camera, they can capture the light for about two or three minutes, and then you get this kind of uh, image. You can also, so this quantification, sorry, this is detection by a good CCD camera. You can also quantify it. You can grind up the plant, put it into a 96 valve plate, add the substrate and ATP, <coughs> and measure it in 96 valve format in a luminometer. Luminometer also uh, has got a detection system that just quantifies the amount of photons or light that's emitted. <coughs> Um, two more examples before I go into um, how to use reporter genes. Um, Lexi, like beta galactosidase uh, is an E. coli, e. coli enzyme that is naturally, naturally occurring. It uh, is used to break down lactose and turn into glucose and galactose. Okay. And this actually feeds substrate. So the substrate naturally for um, for uh, beta galactosidase is lactose. But of course, if you give lactose, you cannot actually visualize or quantify glucose and galactose. Well, you can, but it's very difficult. So what they did was develop alternative substrates. And you can see here that uh, lactose is actually a beta galactosidase binding to glucose. But instead, of, they have removed the glucose and put uh, bromochloroindolyl instead, or they put for methyl and belafuryl instead, okay, and the structure. And what happens is that the enzyme will still recognize the beta D galactoside bond and split the molecule. And then you get um, the release of these compounds, so as for methyl and belafuryl and chlorobromo indigo. This forms a blue precipitate. And this is a fluorescent molecule. So here you can visualize the localization of the enzyme. Here you can quantify the activity of the enzyme. So it's basically just using alternative substrates that are also used by the enzyme. And obviously, the more enzyme you have present, the more of this substrate will be turned over, and the more blue precipitate or the more fluorescence you will get. So alternative substrates. And then the other one is beta glucuronidase or GUS. It's actually the same principle, exactly the same principle, except that it is a beta D glucuronide bond instead of a beta D um, galactoside bond. Okay. So now let's go into how do we use reporter genes. As I said before, reported genes are cloned in constructs to be transferred into organisms for testing. You're never interested in the expression of the reported gene itself or the, the behavior of the gene itself into a other species. Um, you're interested in um, if I put this reported gene behind a promoter, um, what does the promoter do? Can I easily detect the localization of the promoter or the activity of the promoter? And um, that's the way they are used. So I just very basically put here um, a promoter reporter fusion. So they're interested in a certain promoter. <coughs> it can be whatever you choose. Um, a certain gene, for example, that you're interested in, and you want to you ask yourself, how does promoter behave? And um, you can put the reporter gene behind it, and then put a terminator of transcription. And you transfer this into uh, this 
basically sweet. And you can localize the promoter activity. Okay. Um, here, it turned out that the whole wheat plant didn't have any expression. But if they were looking at the wheat kernels, they saw that in the wheat embryo, so this is the wheat kernel with the, um, the food basically for the embryo, and this is the embryo itself from which the new wheat plant will develop. And so they noticed that if they stain this with the alternative substrate, then you get a blue precipitate, so it means the promoter that you're interested in is only active in the wheat embryos and nowhere else in the plant. So I've put here no post-transcriptional or translational regulation. Why do I say this? Anybody have an idea how why I say that? It's a cDNA that you put in the construct. Yes, the reporter is a cDNA, but it's I think I'll do it. I think, I think you're on the right track, but um, um, this is a promoter only. So if you think about, normally this promoter would have behind it the normal gene, the gene that is expressed in the embryo. Okay. And um, if this gene is expressed, then you get a messenger RNA of this gene. And this messenger RNA has got a certain half-life that depends on the expression that is brought about with the promoter, but also the breakdown of this messenger RNA. And this messenger RNA can be broken down, for example, um, by interaction with microRNAs, or just because of its intrinsic half-life. Now, in this case, you have the promoter, and the messenger RNA is not the messenger RNA of the original gene, but it's the messenger RNA of the reporter protein, which is a different messenger RNA. And this different messenger RNA is not susceptible to this microRNA breakdown or to this regulation that's happening on this other messenger RNA from the endogenous gene. So that's therefore what you measure is purely the activity of the promoter without any post-inscriptional regulation. Usually the messenger RNAs and the proteins of the reported gene are very, very stable, much more stable than the endogenous gene. Okay. So therefore, I mentioned here, I say here, no post-transcriptional or translational regulation. It has high half-life of reporter protein, so you get an accumulation and of promoter activity, of uh, reporter activity, and so you can actually even visualize weak promoter activities. So um, promoter studies, um, you can measure the strength of the promoter and also the localization of its activity. But there's no guarantee that the messenger of the endogenous gene will actually be stable in these tissues. You can solve this by doing fusion proteins. There you can do protein studies. Um, you have the promoter. You have also the gene of interest, and preferably the seed. Well, you can do the cDNA or the genomic DNA of the gene of interest. You can choose. And usually the cDNA is used. Behind that, you put the reporter gene in a translational fusion. That means a translational fusion is actually that um, this whole open reading frame that is being produced is going to be turned into one single protein, which means that if you clone this construct, you remove the stop codon of your gene of interest. Because if you keep the stop codon, you will get two different proteins, or maybe only one. So you <coughs> remove the stop codon, and instead of the stop codon, you straight away use the star codon, the ATG of the reporter. And then you get one single protein with a reporter gene tag onto it. And uh, in this case, we do have a post-transcriptional or post-translational regulation. Uh, post-translational because you know, your protein of interest is there, so it can be regulated post-translationally. Post-transcriptional because also your messenger RNA of your gene of interest is coupled to the messenger RNA of the reporter. And if you have any regulation on this messenger RNA, the whole message, also the reporter part, is going to be broken down or regulated. And here, you can do a, for example, a subcellular targeting of the reported protein by the protein of interest. This gene of interest, also the first part of the gene, may contain the um, targeting sequence um, to target <coughs> the proteins to um, the localization where it should be, like um, the nucleus or the mitochondria or the chloroplast or whatever. 
that's the golden first part of the gene of interest. And so the protein is going to be targeted to its right place, and the report is going to tell you where it is. And here you have an example of um, nerve cells, where you see that they close a promoter gene of interest together with GFP, and they notice that the protein is expressed or targeted to the uh, nuclei of these um, nerve cells. Okay, so now I'll go a bit into the, uh, our own research, and the example is metal stress. Um, it can actually be any trigger. So if you want to look at it generally, uh, I use specifically metal stress, but you can look at it generally and um, just replace metal stress by trigger, environmental trigger or developmental trigger. It's just a trigger that changes something within the plant. I use plants here as an example, but it can also be a trigger that changes something into a uh, tissue of humans or um, mice or whatever. So in this case, we have a trigger, which is excess metals like <coughs> cadmium or copper, like polluting um, quantities of it. This causes oxidative stress, and this alters gene expression. As an example here, it's a lipoxygenase gene of uh, Epoxygenase G number four and number five. Um, and this is the control level. So plants that are not exposed to excess cadmium or copper. So they have got a gene expression level of one. If you have cadmium, the gray bars, you see that LUX4 gene expression is slightly upregulated. LUX5 gene expression doesn't change. This is measured by real time PCR. If you um, add copper, you see that. Lipoxygenase G number four is upregulated three and a half volts, whereas it's uh, downregulated. Uh, the LOX5 gene is downregulated. So we wonder, <coughs> actually, um, we have noticed that these LOX4 and LOX5 gene expressions are very important for the plant response. But the question is, like, how is this achieved? How, how is this gene expression? What's in between the perception of the excess metals and the change in gene expression later on? And to study this, we have actually um, developed a transgenic construct. So if you think about the uh, endogenous state of the plant, the, the endogenous state of the plant is that you have a LUX promoter, you have a LUX gene, and terminate of transcription. And what we have done in the previous graph is measure steady state messaging RNA by real time PCR. Okay. Our working model is that excess metals are somehow perceived by some sensing mechanism, and it's not really known at the moment yet what it is. This would trigger a signaling pathway. The signaling pathway would eventually activate transcription factors. Transcription factors bind to promoter elements of genes and activate their transcription. Okay. So this would be the promoter elements of these oxygenase genes that we see uh, change in gene expression of. So what we do, we took the promoter, the LOX promoter, coupled the beta-glucuronidase or GUS reporter gene. And this way we have a very similar system, except you have the reporter gene, and we measure promoter activity by using GUS enzymatic assays. So okay. then the question is, we have a long promoter sequence, but which little DNA sequence of the promoter is important for regulating this uh, gene expression or basically for binding transcription factors. How many base pairs do you think will be, or in the approximately would be important to binding transcription factor? Is it hundreds of base pairs or 10? Or is it five or six or just one? What is an idea of the magnitude of sequences you need for binding one transcription factor? Yeah, 20, it's possible. We just a little bit less sometimes, like 10. You have, basically, you have in the DNA sequence, you have like a core binding sequence. Sometimes it's only like five nucleotides or five base pairs. But then you also have, this can be repeated as well if you have transcription factors binding as dimers. <coughs> then you have only 10. And then the context sequence around it also um, can 
uh, specify the binary affinity of the subscription factor. So what we're looking for, let's say 20, okay? Let's, let's say we're looking for like a 20 base pair sequence in this whole promoter that is regulating the expression of the promoter under having that express, okay? So um, a promoter is usually, let's say, it's arbitrary, because you don't know where it's where it is. Um, so usually we take about 1,000 base pairs here. And in this 1,000 base pair, we're looking for like a 20 base pair sequence that is regulating. So what can we do? We can take away sequences of this promoter by making deletion constructs. Okay? So the black boxes here are deletions, so they're not there anymore. Okay. Um, we take away sequences and we see what's happening. And we put this again into this CUS reporter key. Uh, we want to see what's happening in the plants. So we grow plants and we want to see what's happening under copper exposure, like too much copper. Right? So that's top plants. And we also have control plants, of course, that are not exposed to excess copper. And so we have the native promoter that is upregulated under copper stress and then the deletion variant of it. Um, if we transfer all of these different ones, okay, we transfer this one into the plants, this one, this one, etc., and we measure the GUS expression. But the problem is we have we may have a different transformation efficiency between transferring this one and this one. And then we think, okay, here we have less expression. So this means that because we have less expression, this um, <laughs> region was important to have the high expression. But it could also be that we have less expression here because when we did this transformation into the plants, it was just less efficient than we did the first transformation. <laughs> How can we solve this? We can solve it by using a different reference promoter to a luciferase reporter gene and use this as an internal reference. So here, the reference promoter activity should not be um, regulated by copper, which means that it should be the same in um, these plants and these plants. And that's why I call it the reference promoter. Usually from previous studies, we have a pretty good idea which genes are not. It's, it's similar to the, basically what we used here was the, the promoter of a uh, reference gene that we use for real-time PCR. Because we know it's not um, regulated by the, by the condition. Okay, so if we normalize it, we can do the transformation with both together, so this one together with the reference construct, this one together with the reference construct, this one together with the reference construct, etc. through the copper and the control, to a protein extraction of these tissues and measure gas activity and luciferase activity. Okay? So how does it work? Basically protein extraction, the crude protein extract will do. We don't have to purify the proteins, just the lamb cheese would, would, would be uh, sufficient. And you put it into 96 well plates. <coughs> And the 96 valve plates contain the protein extract, but also the substrate for the GUS enzyme or for the luciferase enzyme. And we detect the substrate turnover rate. Okay? We do it in a 96 valve format in this uh, system that can measure uh, absorbance, fluorescence, and luminescence. In this case, we need fluorescence for the GUS activity and um, luminometer, so detection of photons for the luciferase activity. <coughs> Um, I said before, fluorescence is like an excitation with one wavelength and emission with another one. In this case, the um, MU, this is the um, material of is excited at 365 nanometers and measured at 455 nanometers. And so what we get, we divide our gas activity by luciferate activity. And if you see here, <coughs> compared to the level where you have no copper, so this is the control plants, the control plants have a basal level of um, gus by luciferase activity. The promoter here, the full length promoter, is activated by the excess metal, so we have a higher expression. Also, all the other constructs have a higher expression, they have an induction, except if we remove these 20 base pairs from the promoter, the induction <laughs> is lost. It's almost back to control levels again, which means that here, we remove this part. This part that we removed is important for the induction of the promoter by the environmental trigger. Okay, so 
we have now defined the promoter element that is important for triggering, um, but actually which is perceiving this whole signaling cascade. Now we have to work our way up, and we can actually work our way up from promoter element to transcription factor. How can we do that with a yeast one hybrid screen? Have you heard about yeast one hybrid or yeast two hybrid? Okay. So in this case, uh, we are wondering which transcription factor is binding this 20 base pair um, DNA sequence. And so we amplify this little piece with PCR. Uh, on the end of the PCR products, we incorporate in the primers um, restriction sites <coughs> or uh, restriction enzymes. Why? Because then we can clone it into a um, vector here. I'll explain a little bit later which, what this spectrum is. What do we also need? We, uh, we, all, we not only need to um, we don't only need this as a mate to actually um, find the transcription factors, we also need transcription factors themselves. Okay. So we have a plant that we uh, expose to excess copper, uh, we isolate the messenger RNA, and we clone the full-length cDNA into another uh, plasmid. Why is it important that, I asked the question to you, why is it important that we use messenger RNA from a plant that has experienced copper excess? Can we also use a control plant? Yeah, Yes, exactly. Transcription factor that is uh, responsible for binding this promoter under copper excess. May it's also possible that the transcription factor is only expressed when the plant is under excess copper. Maybe the transcription factor is not even expressed in control plants. And then we will not, never be able to find it if we use messenger RNA from a control plant. Okay? So it's very important to design your experiment correctly in this way. Okay. So um, here, this little piece of DNA, we uh, clone it into um, a vector just in front of a reported gene. In this case, it's green fluorescent protein. And um, if you look at it a little bit more closely here, the green, um, the green red piece that's in this vector. It's actually like the target element, so the element that we have that we're using to bind description factor, the red part. Then we have a minimal promoter that will activate this transcription of the reporter gene, but only in certain uh, events, and that is when a activating domain, so in this case it's called B42, it can also be the GAL4 activating domain, but an activating domain will actually activate this promoter sequence. But this activating domain will not bind directly here. It will only bind if it is um, brought in the vicinity by the transcription <coughs> factor that binds this target element. How can we achieve that? That is by cloning this full-length cDNAs into um, the vectors here, um, just behind this B42 domain. So basically, all of these vectors have this B42 domain, but different cDNAs of the plant. Okay. So all these factors will have a combination of B42 activation domain with one particular protein of the plant. Yes. And how do you actually make sure that the, the red piece of promoter area is not like half the transcription factor binding site? Okay, um, if it would have been half the transcription factor binding site, we probably wouldn't have, uh, in this case, we wouldn't have observed this. But if, if, if half the site is missing, then the and you wouldn't get uh, activation in here. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's something you need to control. What they usually do here for, for making sure that it doesn't happen is um, you, you, you bake the, the piece long enough. So I just mentioned 20 base pairs, you need to take a little bit more, okay. um, just to be sure. Also, before they go into, um, before they go into this uh, other essays, they do some more extended studies to, to delineate the, uh, the suspecting elements, how they call it, to, to make sure that they have the right piece. We can also do like a, a mobility shift assay and things like that to actually um, spy finding the pro having DNA sequence 
finding the uh, description factor. If yeah, I can do, do several kinds of methods to actually um, make sure that the piece that you have is actually the right piece to use. Okay. That's a good question. Um, okay, well, this, I was here. Okay, so um, then this one is also always co transfected into cells together with one of these. So this with this one, or this with this one. And you only get green colonies with green fluorescent protein expression <coughs> when, um, when the expression, when this vector expresses a protein that will bind the target element. And when it does, then you get the activation domain having a description of the fluorescent reported gene. So every green yeast cell, you have um, a positive interaction. Then you isolate this yeast cell, you isolate again the uh, DNA from it, and you actually try to find out which cDNA was in there, and then from cDNA you can know which transcription factor was actually binding there. Okay, so um, what I also want to point out, point out is that there's a difference between a reporter gene and a selectable marker gene. The reporter gene is actually um, reporting, it's always there, and all cells are alive. You see here, you have white yeast cells and green yeast cells, basically. So um, if you have a selectable marker gene, then you would use, for example, antibiotic resistance. And if you would apply this to this uh, condition, there would be an antibiotic into the plate. And you would get no colonies at all, except the ones with positive interaction. They would grow because they would be resistant to the antibiotic. Um, we have to work a little bit more upstream so we can identify transcription factors. How can we identify these components here? That can be achieved, for example, by forward genetics. Forward genetics. And in this case, we have the same promoter, GUS, terminator. We make transgenic plants. So that's by doing agrobacterium infiltration of the flowers. We produce transgenic seed. The seeds are grown into plants. You select a transgenic plant, sell it, select it again for expression of the report for gene. You have T2 plants. And then, okay, the pathway leading to this altered expression of the gene can contain many components like sensors, signaling pathway components, description factors. And they're all, all of these components in the signaling pathway are encoded somewhere in the genome. I've represented here the genome of Arabidopsis with five chromosomes, got five chromosomes, not ten in total, but sometimes five. And um, the LOX promoter, LOX gene endogenously is located somewhere on the genome. We have introduced the LOX promoter reporter gene construct, and we, don't, we do not have any control where it's going to be localized, it's going to integrate somewhere in the genome, so I've just randomly put it here, it can be anywhere else, but it doesn't matter. And so, if you have an altered promoter activity of this promoter, you also have an altered promoter activity of this promoter, and so you can measure the different, you can visualize this promoter activity by measuring GUS gene expression. Okay. So, uh, normally we would get a high GUS activity if we trigger the plant with the um, excess copper. What if we do a mutagenesis? Right? We, if we do a mutagenesis, we randomly make mutations into the genome and we select mutants that are missing a component of the pathway. So, for example, there's a mutation here. And because of this mutation, one signaling pathway component is missing or perhaps one transcription factor is missing and therefore we, get, we don't get any gas activity anymore. Okay. It's also possible that we, by chance, have a mutation in this area that it's also um, the activity destroyed. Usually you isolate uh, a number of mutants um, to be able to identify a number of components in the upstream pathway. So if you um, knock out uh, signaling components in this pathway, also knock out the promoter activity or the gas activity. And then uh, to work your way back from this mutant, because you don't actually know at that point what gene it is, uh, you have to work with uh, molecular techniques, you have to work your way back towards the actual gene. And it depends on the mutagenesis that you use. 
if you use like a, an insertion uh, of a tDNA, you have a tDNA sequence that you can use and determine the flanking sequence from within the tDNA. So if you use like EMS mutagenesis, you introduce port mutations, and then you have to work your way back with man-based cloning or with high throughput sequencing. But um, that's uh, just for information <coughs> detail. Okay, so to summarize, um, metal stress leads to alter gene expression. Um, we have, I've shown you how we can use uh, promoter how we can use four genes to discover promoter elements by deletion and states, useful hybrids to discover transcription factors, and forward genetics to actually identify components in this pathway. If we identify components, sometimes they are known, not known, sometimes they have been annotated as a protein, sometimes they're like unknown protein. It's also interesting, of course. Um, sometimes it can be oxidative stress-related proteins or iron transports, for example. Uh, why an iron transporter? Because if the iron transport doesn't work, maybe the plant doesn't take up the excess copper, so it doesn't experience it. Um, and so we are using this uh, methodology to actually find out how triggers and oxidative stress can alter uh, gene expression. And that's basically it for today. Unless you have any questions, I'm available.